Washington DC residents are recovering today after about a month's worth of rain fell in one hour yesterday. I'm Mark Liverman with a look at some of the hardest hit areas. I'm Mike Dennison. Coming up, I'll tell you about a new wrinkle in the Yellowstone Club liquor law investigation. It's a computer that has been designed specifically to survive space, and more specifically, to make it to the moon. 6.30 on this Tuesday, Chet Lehman, uh, Missy O'Malley with you. Uh, Matt has our forecast in a moment. Our top story, uh, Washington, D.C. residents are starting to dry out and clean up. This after being slammed by heavy rain, flash floods, and power outages. CBS's News' Mark Liverman has more. It would have been easier to swim than drive across some of the roads at our nation's capital Monday. Three to four inches fell in just one hour around the D.C. area during the morning's commute. Heavy rushing water left dozens of drivers stranded or stuck. Some even had to stand on the roofs of their cars. Water started leaking into my car, got up to my seat, and I said, now it's time to get on the sunroof. So you weren't scared at all? I mean, I was con definitely concerned. I mean, water levels rising. It's not really something you learn in driver's ed's class or ever, what to do when the water's up to your window. A waterfall formed inside one of the city's underground metro stations and in the elevator of another. Residents even had to contend with sinkholes that opened up along roadways. So you can kind of use some sort of inferences to know how deep it is, but it's always a risk. Unless you have a larger vehicle, I wouldn't recommend it, especially with some of, some of the smaller, low-profile sedans and whatnot. This is fast-moving water cut right through some restaurants and businesses. Flooding was so severe at this location, you can barely tell it's a parking garage. The National Archives, home to the Constitution and Bill of Rights, was also closed because high waters caused a power outage there. But all the documents are safe. Mark Liverman, CBS News. Wow. Well, good news for area residents after the storm. Forecast is now calling for sun for the next few days in the D.C. area. Holy moly. Free parking moly. for submarines in that one for a period of time. So that was all good, too, for the Navy. Wow. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable amounts of rain that they had. Yeah. Uh, we have some pretty hefty amounts in parts of Montana early this morning. Right here. Yeah, we picked up about a quarter inch of rain at Bozeman Yellowstone International. Wow. Temperatures uh, continue to be on the cool side. Look at that, a quarter inch of rain out uh, in Belgrade. Eight tenths of an inch uh, as you get into eastern parts of the state. So uh, pretty impressive stuff. Early morning temperatures into the 40s. Uh, really not much to complain about. There will be a few showers trying to roll through. The cool temperatures remain for today. It looks like we'll top out into the 70s uh, for the afternoon. But we do have more warm weather heading this direction. More on that, of course, coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you for that, Matt. Now 632, our top local story for you here. State officials have seized another 800 bottles and cans of alcoholic beverages from businesses linked to the exclusive Yellowstone Club in Big Sky. And Dan's Mike Dennison has the latest on this investigation. The Montana Revenue Department revealed Monday that State Justice Department investigators seized the beer, wine, and liquor on June 25th from a building near the Bozeman International Airport in Belgrade. That was one day after the state had announced an earlier settlement of multiple liquor law violations by the high-end private club in Big Sky. That June settlement included a $370,000 fine for Yellowstone Club restaurants and bars and temporary suspension of their liquor licenses for periods of 7 to 20 days, depending on the location. But state revenue officials wouldn't clarify on Monday how or whether this latest seizure is related to the earlier case. The state says the seized alcohol was in possession of h &K Spirits. Its listed officers are Hans Williamson and John Henkel, who had been chief financial officer of the Yellowstone Club. And as part of the earlier settlement, Williamson is supposed to be removed from management and ownership positions at the club's restaurants and bars. In that earlier case, Yellowstone Club restaurant and bar operators admitted to serving alcohol at two sites without a license, hiding liquor from state investigators, and storing booze at unlicensed warehouses in Bozeman. The Yellowstone Club's attorney didn't immediately provide any comment on Monday. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. Now, in that earlier case, the state seized about 9,000 bottles and cans of liquor, beer, and wine controlled by the Yellowstone Club. Now, a follow-up to a story that we've had for you yesterday. Court documents are providing new information on Sunday's fatal hit-and-run that left a 9-year-old boy dead in Hamilton. Suspect in the case made his first court appearance uh, on Monday. Joseph McNamara was charged with negligent homicide, failure to remain in an accident for the death of that young boy. This comes after he fled the scene of the crash, led authorities on a six-hour manhunt Sunday afternoon. 
as you well know, there's a nine-year-old child that's never going home again. So. Now, according to several witnesses, the defendant was traveling eastbound on Golf Course Road at rates almost double the posted speed limit when he hit the child who was crossing the street or walking a scooter. Prosecutors say McNamara got out of his car and approached the boy. The boy's father then ran from their house, handed the defendant a phone, and asked him to call 911. The defendant kept the phone and then drove east. He later visited his girlfriend who told authorities he had consumed at least one beer. McNamara told her he hit something and asked for a ride. She refused and then McNamara left on foot. He was found at a residence after nearly a six hour manhunt was arrested without incident. Now during the court appearance, prosecuting attorney Angela Whetstone expressed concern for the defendant's transient nature. The nature of the charges don't speak for themselves. But ultimately, I think it's the defendant's conduct in this case that is most enlightening. Um, he knew what he did, he knew how serious it was, and he did his best efforts to get away from law enforcement to not uh, be accountable for this conduct. The defendant refused a blood test and claimed he had smoked something after the crash. Bail was set at $500,000. He was not allowed to purchase alcohol or have contact with the family or his girlfriend. His, his next court appearance is set for later this month. In court uh, yesterday, McNamara also said he was threatened at gunpoint while driving his vehicle and that he left the scene because of those threats. No witness accounts reported anyone else in his car and photographs also did not show anyone else in the van. In other headlines this morning, a high-speed police pursuit through the Mission Valley has landed a man in jail. Lake County Sheriff Don Bell says 29-year-old Matthew Harold Van Valen of Manzula was arrested after a pursuit that began late, late uh, that last night in Ronan and ended 36 miles later at Gray Wolf Peak Casino in Evero. Uh, Wolf, uh, Bell states the pursuit started around 11 p.m. when a Lake County deputy noticed a vehicle in Ronan that fit the description of a stolen vehicle out of Missoula. There's also a dog in that stolen vehicle. A car, uh, the driver of that vehicle fled it in an attempted traffic stop at a high rate of speed, heading southbound out of Ronan. Spike strips were placed on Highway 93 where the suspect lost control and crashed into the pillars of the casino. Suspect abandoned the vehicle, ran inside the building where several law enforcement officers chased him. He was arrested outside the casino where authorities say a weapon was also recovered. Van Valen remains in the Missoula County Detention Center. He faces charges out of Missoula and Lake Counties. And a Bozeman woman was arrested on Friday after spraying her ex-boyfriend with bear spray during an argument. Rexelaine Doris Peary appeared in Gallatin County Justice Court yesterday facing multiple charges. Police responded around 2 o'clock Friday afternoon for a report that Peary had bear sprayed someone in an apartment near West College Street. The incident involved Peary, her husband, her ex-boyfriend, and another woman who lives at that apartment. Peary was having an argument with her husband and told police she intentionally deployed the bear spray toward the two men when they began to approach her and she said she was acting in self-defense. Officers later found meth in Peary's possession. She has two prior cases of bear spraying someone else as well. Now it's been a decade in the making and now a computer made entirely by students at Montana State University has a date with the moon. It's called the Rad PC. NASA has selected it to be a part of a demonstration as soon as next year. MTN's Cody Boyer shows us the technology behind this computer. And they've gotten experience flying it on balloons and rockets that just go up and come down on the space station. Professor Brock Lemire says it has been a decade-long experience of lunar proportions, and the product, at least as of now, is the size of a toy block. The purpose of this technology is to provide a computer for future space missions that can provide increased computation above what they currently have and also provide resistance to space radiation. Lemire says that can force computers to crash. So using everyday materials anyone could get, he adds they found a cheaper alternative for an improvement. Current computers uh, that NASA uses and aerospace companies use make them resistant to radiation and it causes them to be quite expensive and also run uh, pretty slow compared to the computers we have on Earth. We call it off the shelf uh, parts. It will look something like this when it actually goes into space. Brock says the amount of work that has gone into it is amazing, but just how many students who have put their heads and hands into it as well, that's even more so.
This has been 100% built by MSU students and primarily undergraduate students. In about 10 years, over 130 students have worked on Rad PC, including second year grad student Chris Major. It was pretty awesome. I mean, thinking that this thing's going to go into space was. It's a combination of excitement and terror. It's NASA's Artemis project, which will attach computers like rad PCs to landers bound for the moon, someday, maybe even Mars. An experience overall that will have Professor Lemire looking up following the effort that dozens of students made happen. It's surreal, to be honest with you, to think that uh, we've been working on this idea for 10 years and now actually putting on it on the surface of the moon. Lemire says there's still plenty of legwork to be done. First, his students are working hard to get the computer down to its final form and will be able to test it again on a satellite that will be launched this fall. They plan on having Rad PC ready to fly to the moon as early as late 2020. In Bozeman, Cody Boyer, MTN News.